This evening, what I'm going to spend a bit of time is ruminating on the idea of King, specifically, and the idea of a post-racial America. Now, I'm going to frame it in, quite, in that way because I know that on the flyer it said that we were going to be talking about, about a post-racial society and Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. So I want to let you know this wasn't a bait and switch. I believe in truth and advertising. So I'll be clear with what I'm going to speak about, which is a slightly different nuance, and I think you'll understand why. What I'm going to spend time talking about is King and the idea of a post-racial America. Now, allow me to begin with a specification. As we approach the issue of King, in the context of questioning whether we have, in any meaningful way, moved closer to a post-racial America, it is important to be clear about why it is helpful to use the term America and not simply the United States or not simply the term society. So I'm using America for a very specific reason. It is important to be clear that when we speak about King and the idea of race in our context, we are very much involved with the imaginative construction of a nation and only secondarily with the workings of a political entity. It is my sense that the former term is more appropriately evoked with the idea of America. So when we're talking about a nation, America more fitfully captures that imaginatively, whereas the language of the United States captures the idea of a political entity in a different kind of way. So that as, as these words are spoken, they evoke very different things and they emote very different things. As we notice this distinction, political scientists help provide um, clarity that these are two very different and distinct ways of talking about a geographical configuration which is constructed by a set of political or legal agreements. I mean, after all, that's all a country is. It's that it's a particular place on the earth that has formed itself based around various sorts of political and legal agreements. The former, a nation, which is what we are more concerned about, brings with it a pre-thematic framing which relies on the category of peoplehood. While the latter applies most appropriately to persons who are joined together in a polis by a political arrangement. Now, peoplehood and political arrangement are not the same things. Another way of thinking about this is that one has to do with an idea of thinking of oneself belonging to a larger body in the deepest levels of one's being. And the other is simply a descriptive way of talking about a society in which one holds membership. So that's why we'll be speaking more about nation. While time does not permit a full delineation of the difference between these two ways of thinking about the country of which many of us are a part, I do think it is important to note dimensions uh, it, because there are several dimensions emerging from this distinction which will be helpful interpreting how King's ideas might unfold in a discussion about a post-racial America. So you're all with me now, so you don't feel as if you've gotten into the dealership and you were going to get one item and you get another. When you understand why I'm talking about America as opposed to simply a post-racial society. Now see, y'all could have said amen and that would have been all right. You know, that would have been fine. Now the first dimension of this distinction is with the way that the idea of nation is grounded in primarily biological and not geographic imaginings. That is to say, the term nation has as its primary field of meaning uh, in what we might think of as kinship narratives. So stories that people tell that remind them of the group 
to which they are a part and that weave them into the history of that group. And these stories or narratives are rooted in what social scientists call primordial connections, which is what I meant by connections that we feel at the deepest levels of our being. As several theorists such as Balabar and Wallerstein have noted, this has meant that in modernity, as it has unfolded in the West, nationhood has been conceptually coterminous with the idea of peoplehood. Now this has meant that as nations have risen in the West and in the rest of the world denominated by the West in the colonial period, there has always been a substantial component of their imaginative construction which has relied on categories like language, culture, and custom, or ethnicity, in short. That's the 75-word sentence. I always put at least one 75-word sentence in all of the lectures that I give so you all can rationalize for yourself why you came out this evening. <laughs> so I appreciate, I appreciate you being here. Now, we have seen this in the history of our own nation in the collapsing of any meaningful distinction between American nationhood and discrete constructions of Northwestern European ethnicity during the Jacksonian era, as well as in contemporary cases like the refusal of many of the Swiss population a few years back to vote to receive their Islamic neighbors as citizens, or Another example is in the French refusal to grant citizenship to third and fourth generation North African immigrants who had migrated to France to first help liberate France from the Nazis and then secondarily to help rebuild France after World War II. So the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of North African uh, Algerians who helped to rid France of the Nazis have never been recognized as citizens of France. They are simply visitors after three generations. This is what I mean. This is where citizenship has been totally reduced to ethnic and filial lines. So it doesn't matter how long you've been there, what you've done for the society, you're still nothing more than a visitor. Now, we see this as well in those parts of the non-European world that had fallen under the political, economic, and ideological sway of colonization. Many conflicts in Africa and Asia have been precisely about which ethnicity or tribe would be the founding people of the nation and who would be the foreigner. So as we look at tribal conflicts all over Africa, it boils down to who does this nation belong to and who is the visitor. So who is the foreigner and who's the one that belongs here? The Rwandan genocide is perhaps the starkest example of this thinking. And on the European continent, the Balkan Wars of the 1990s are a stark example of this identification of nationhood and peoplehood. Now, all of which is to say that deeply embedded in the nations which were born within modernity and whose formation is entangled with the Western colonial project is the ideological deep structure, as Edward Farley would call it, that nations are primarily ethnic entities which may or may not exist in larger political structures based upon some other test of membership. So this then is the first dimension uh, uh, of this distinction between uh, peoplehood and nation and between America and the United States conceptually. The second dimension to which we turn our notice is the competing notion that is also born in modernity, specifically the Enlightenment, that it is indeed possible to build a nation based upon shared ideals and convictions, with ethnicity being simply a side conversation. This is the idea of country or nation which animated most notably the American and French revolutions. The Declaration of Independence is the example par excellence of this idea taking material form. 
What this document and the idea behind of what I want to identify as a third distinction which I am making, and, or, uh, and this dimension has specifically to do with the materialization of nationhood. Now when I say the materialization of nationhood, everything we've been talking about, we've been talking about happening on the conceptual level. So what, whether one believes that nations are built by simple biological transmission and connection, or one believes that nations are built by shared commitments to the ideals. These are the conceptual understandings that become materialized in actual physical political entities. And so what I want to shift to to talk a bit now is to talk about this whole materialization of nationhood or more precisely how the nation takes flesh in the material unfolding of human history. It is this unfolding which is most properly understood as the ground of political formations and configurations. So that is to say that the material reality of nations is a secondary kind of thing to the idea of what it is that establishes and gives life to the nation. The idea of the United States of America is most properly understood to operate within this realm. So what I'm suggesting as the, uh, is that the idea of America operates on the realm of the conceptual pre-thematic understanding of what nation is. And when we talk about the United States of America, we most immediately think about the political arrangements that have actually taken material form so that you can see something that you call the United States of America on the map. Now this is the imaginative space in which we actually order the material relations of the previously conceived nation. By material relations, I mean such things as laws, understandings about citizenship, geographic demarcations, etc. Put another way, this dimension has to do with the governance of a nation, while the two previous dimensions that I've been speaking about have to do with the being of a nation. Now, any of you who are, um, or have been in seminary classes know this is very similar to talking about uh, the church and the whole idea of act and being, that, uh, that the material form of the thing is apart from the actual being of the thing. So I'm making a very similar uh, distinction here. At this point, I think a clear statement of how I understand the dynamism between these three dimensions of distinction would be helpful. Put plainly, the third dimension, the imaginative space of materialization and governance is the ground upon which the two competing ways of defining the being of a nation is contested. So this is why, for instance, uh, we currently live in the midst of a colossal conflict between these two ways of understanding what America is. And the, re and the way that it's being resolved is by the battle over whether or not we should repeal the 14th Amendment, which is the amendment that actually says who is an American and who's not. So this is what I mean by uh, the, the contestation that goes on between these two ideas about what creates a nation actually happens in battles over the laws that govern that nation and the arrangements that govern that nation. Now precisely because the dynamic tension between uh, the two ways of thinking about nation uh, and two understandings of nationhood and modernity is ongoing, it is a mistake to believe that a particular materialization of the nation represents a resolution of this tension one way or the other. And while I'll talk about this a little bit more, where we see this mistake happening is that many believed that the battle over what America was was resolved on November, 3rd, or November 2nd in the year 2008. But we found out on, December, on November 3rd that the battle was merely joined. Right? 
So, what I want to suggest is that it is a mistake because it makes opaque the lingering senses of entitlement, grievance, and unsettled anguish which underlies all historical narrations of peoplehood vis-a-vis -vis other people. It is precisely this naivete which led to the tragic national dissolutions and attendant genocides of the 20th century and to the bewilderment of much of the Western world both prior to and during the unfolding of these genocides. So we are reminded that mistaken interpretations of the dynamism between these dynamics of nationhood and geopolitical entities can have substantial and deadly consequence. Everyone believed that Yugoslavia was a nation that would continue to exist into the 21st century and not be dissolved in ethnic cleansing and genocide at the end of the 20th century. Everyone believed that Rwanda would continue to be a place where two tribes who had at least in some ways figured out a way to live with each other would continue to be a model for Southern Africa as opposed to the cauldron of ethnic genocide. So you see, getting a bad read on this thing can have significant consequences because it can make you believe things about the state of a society that really aren't true. Now, we see this mistaken conceit of modernity that ideals will always trump tribal uh, loyalties at work in our present national context with the birth and rise of the Tea Party movement in response to the election of Barack Obama as president of the United States. Now, Barack Obama is president of the United States of America. Barack Obama is the president of some portion of America. And he is an imposter for some other portion of America. This is the distinction that I'm making. What is also helpfully seen in this particular historic moment is that the idea of, post, of a post-racial America, a post-racial society, often evoked after the election of President Obama, is a category of the third dimension of the dynamism between nationhood and geopolitical entities. So what we can see that he is legally the president of the United States of America, but he's only president of part of America. So that shows us then that as this thing unfolds, it unfolds on the ground then of, uh, of, of the geopolitics and of the legal uh, uh, areas that construct the nation. That is to say, the idea of a post-racial society or a post-racial America is one whose field of imaginative operation relies upon the presumption that a particular historical materialization of geopolitical governments gives witness to the resolution of the tension between these two ways of conceiving the nation in favor of one in a sort of final sort of way. So once again, we all thought on November 2nd we had made great strides. On November 3rd we found we have made some strides, but now the struggle is that much more. What I take from the present moment in our history is that the idea of a post-racial society is premature, if not altogether mistaken. My sense is that this is the case because at least contemporary evocations of this idea rely on a categorical confusion. Contemporary discourses about a post-racial American society rely on the categorical mistake of identifying race as a category whose primary field of meaning is the material, thus leading to the mistaken conclusion that a particular material historic moment, one in which, say, an African American is president, signifies that the category of race is ripe for the thoroughly modern appellation of post. 
What I would argue is that if the category of race is properly placed and properly understood, at least in terms of this conversation, it is in the dynamism between the first dimensions we have identified, namely nation as a function of primordial kinship rooted in ethnicity or grounded in a set of ideals. If it is properly placed here, then we raise the more appropriate question of what race means, not the more naive query of whether it means anything anymore. In this way, we can take seriously that there have been substantial changes in its meaning over time without falling into the satisfying yet unhelpful conclusion that race means nothing. We can also resist the temptation to all, uh, all too easily to move to the modern conceit that the angels of our better nature, as Lincoln would suggest, have finally won the day and the scythe-wielding specter of lethal tribalism, which has written a crimson streak through human history, has been banished. It is just here that I think King can be of significant help because he helps us to answer the question of if a post-racial society is a dangerous fantasy, as I'm suggesting it is, then what ought our dream be? Now, before turning to the specific ways that King thought uh, is helpful to our conversation, let me remind you, as I remind myself always, that before his cultural beatification as a national saint who was a, uh, uh, a penultimate savior of the political system and finally of the cultural system that was U the United States, the more careful and interpreters of King understood and understand today that Martin Luther King Jr. was first and foremost a Christian preacher of the Baptist persuasion. I say that again because it's easy to forget that Martin Luther King Jr. was a Christian preacher of the Baptist persuasion. More importantly, he was an evangelical whose worldview and very way of seeing the world was shaped by scriptural and, ecclesi and ecclesial framings. Scripture and the church's discourses were the hermeneutical lenses through which he interpreted the world and by which he discursively unfolded his judgment thereof. Now that was good. That, that was the dollar sentence there. I'm going to read that again. That was good. I want to get this on tape. And you can quote this if you want to, because this, this, this was all right. More importantly, he was an evangelical whose worldview and the very way of seeing the world was shaped by scriptural and ecclesial framings. Scripture and the church's discourse were the hermeneutical lenses through which he interpreted. So in other words, the lenses through which he saw, made sense of, and responded to the world through which he moved and by which he discursively unfolded his judgments thereof. Now that, that phrase there, discursively unfolded his judgments thereof, that's called preaching, right? I mean, the Bible said it was that, it's preaching. I mean, that, that's all preaching is. So if somebody asks you, what do you do? You can say that you preach, or you can say that I unfold. I unfold my judgments of the world based upon a hermeneutical um, a uh, lens given to me by scripture and by the church's traditions and discourses. One can talk that, that that's all it is, that's, that's all preaching is. Now the patterns of his thought are then given form by a Christian vision of the world. Now let me be clear, Martin Luther King Jr. was not trying to turn the world into a Christian place, but his vision of the world was that that was entirely formed by a Christian understanding of reality. Now, as we raise questions of what he 
uh, might make of things, such as a post-racial society, etc., it is therefore helpful to seek out these framings that he would have used in Scripture and that he would have used in the church's discourses. Now, in his I Have a Dream speech, which is the one from which the title of this lecture or the title that was advertised for this lecture um, is drawn, the most helpful works for the issue before us, because I think that this, this speech is really the most helpful for this question, it seems, as I read it, that he uses a framing that is offered by Paul in the letter of Ephesians. So while he's not trying to sermonically turn his political discourse into simply Christian rhetoric, the way he brings the rhetoric together is with the form that we find um, in, pardon me, not uh, Ephesians, Galatians. Specifically, Paul's ruminations on geo-social and physical materiality and their finally inconsequential meaning in matters of salvation. As King enumerates the ways of contemporary distinctions in the speech, one can almost hear echoes of Paul. And when I say contemporary distinctions, I mean distinctions of race, distinctions of class. You know, Paul talks about there's neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female. Well, King talks about distinctions as well, where Paul intones for all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves in Christ. This is what Paul says. What Martin says is, I have a dream that one day the nation will live up to the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So where Paul says, you are all equal because you have been clothed in Christ, King is saying that the ideals of this nation grants you equality because you are clothed in their vision. Where Paul reminds that in Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, King dreams that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will one day be able to sit down at the table of brotherhood where Paul is unequivocal in stating that for you are all one in Christ. Not just some of you. Not just this one, not just that one, not just the one in the other room, not just the one down, but all of you are one in Christ. King emphatically holds to the idea that that day will come when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the Negro spiritual of old, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. So where Paul says you are all one in Christ, King has a dream when you will all be one in the freedom that is granted by recognizing your kinship in this nation and not your biological connection to some and not others. What we have with this pairing, and I mean, I could go on, if I had more time, I'd go on to do a, a much deeper analysis, but I mean, go back and read the speech for yourself, and then go back and read um, the book of Galatians and lay them beside each other, and you'll see a significant sort of framing. And what I want to suggest is that by uh, what we have with these pairings is that King is not simply using the rhetorical pattern of Scripture filled with contemporary cultural and political content. No, I believe what we have is a vision of American society, which is very much like the eschatological vision of the Christian faith in both its contemporary and proleptic moments. So what King is envisioning is that King is bringing theological content. He is bringing ecclesial discursive framings to talk about what the nation is. Now, as King ruminates the ways of, uh, of, of contemporary distinctions between peoples in the speech, as well, one can almost hear 
uh, continue to hear echoes of Paul. Now, what I want to suggest is that it is with the unfolding of the cultural and political reality that King provides some guidance for our contemporary moment and our contemporary ways of thinking about this question of a post-racial society. So now, what I'm suggesting is, it's probably not a popular thought, but I'll say it again. My assessment is that the idea of a post-racial society is a dangerous illusion. It can lead us to believe that things are different than they are. And what I'm suggesting is that if we f need to find another way to dream about these things, then how might King help us? And what I'm suggesting is that King is unfolding a pattern that we find within the book of Galatians that can help us evoke a different way of understanding what it is that we are seeking if we're not seeking a post-racial society. So now what I'm going to unfold over the next few minutes is more, uh, is more substantially the content of what that vision might look like. And because King was a good Baptist preacher or a good Christian preacher of the Baptist persuasion, when one is speaking about him, one has to be points. Because everyone knows that a good Baptist preacher from the 1960s, three points served. So there are three points, then, which I draw from King's reading of both the cultural and historical situation that he's in, as well as a Christian discursive uh, framing of that. First, what he does is by reminding us that difference as such, difference in race, difference in ethnicity, difference in national origin have no salvific consequence in the realization of America. He thus, and in so doing, this is Paul's whole point, the fact that you're a Jew or Gentile, he's not saying you stop being that. He just says it doesn't mean anything in Christ. He thus rejects the idea that ethnicity is an adequate means to either interpret or express what the idea of America is. So that if you find yourself narrating the story of America and you simply follow, depending on what part of the country you're in, the English or the Scotch-Irish, you have not told the story of America. You've told the story of a little piece of it, but not the story of America. In so doing, he does not dispense with these categories. And see, that's the important thing we want to see. He doesn't dispense with these categories. He says they're still there. You are what you are. You are what history has made you. You are what the narratives of your community have made you. And you shouldn't stop being that, but you shouldn't mistake that for being the narrative of America. That's simply the narrative of your piece of what America is. We are still black, we're still brown, we're still white, we're still Jew, we're still Gentile, we're still Protestant, we're still Catholic. So the point is to recognize that these differences simply are, and that they are our ways of being American. King would say that they are our ways of being children of God. These are all just ways of being children of God. None of them are salvific in nature. They just simply are. The second point the king reminds us, again echoes uh, 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 from Paul, and that second point is that we live into what is the truth of things. We live into it. It is not simply something that we inhabit we progressively live into it by living as a people reconciled by that which constitutes and gives us our very being. This is Paul's argument in that piece of Galatians that we read, that your being comes from Christ. It doesn't come from being Jew or Gentile. That the source of your, the truth of your existence comes from Christ, 
and not from being male or female. King is saying that the truth of your being as an American comes not from your ethnicity, but from your shared striving to make the nation what it can be. So he's using the same kind of framing. But notice he's using it in the same way that Paul sort of unfolds it, that it is something that you live into, not simply something that you are. So you live into the truth. Now the truth is what the truth is. The point is whether or not you are living into the truth or you're living into some other false delusion. Now, when Paul refers to Christ, King refers to the true meaning of the creeds of our nation that materializes the nation. Now, it is by first recognizing that this is first and foremost that which is materialized in the nation. So the point is that what makes America America are the ideals that make America, not some stilted understanding of the Constitution, because the Constitution doesn't make America. The Declaration of Independence makes America. The Constitution simply organizes the way that the nation will govern itself. Uh, uh, now, it is by first recognizing, once again, that this is the thing that's being materialized first and foremost, that King t first tilts the balance of the delicate tension that I talked about towards the idea of nationhood being grounded in that power which calls it into being and away from ethnic readings. So he's evoking an idea of America based upon the power that is greater than any one or any group because it is the transcendent ideals. And that's the reason why a moment ago I identified the uh, Declaration of Independence as being the founding document of the United States. Because think about how that begins. Uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Now, by saying truths to be self-evident, they're making an ontological claim about the state of things and about the nature of reality. Finally, and this is the third point, as if to conjure Paul's conviction that it is only when this consequence of difference is interpreted through Christ that we are free of the law. King ends his speech with the admonition, that is to say, that the song of freedom will only play in our hearts and in our lives when we sing the song together in all of our difference. So when he intones once again, the, he looks forward to that eschatological vision, that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the Negro spiritual of old, free at last, free at last, thank God. Notice you can't sing the song by yourself. His point is you can only sing it in the midst of the plurality of your difference. And this is the same point that Paul is making in Galatians. Paul is making the point in Galatians that if one properly understands the place of one's difference, that it has no salvific consequence in Christ, then one is able to more fully bring whatever gifts of difference one has and is able to do it in such a way that the body of Christ is built up. And this is a point that Paul brings up when he begins to unfold the narration of uh, what are the gifts that many bring to the church. In closing, I want to note that King never dispenses with the idea of race. So this is why I don't think he would be able to make any sense of this idea of a post-racial America. What he does is reinterpret it in such a way that we can have no meaning of what its real meaning is apart from being gathered together with those of us or being gathered together with those whose differences bring a dynamism and creativity so that our experience of our own uniqueness 
is given meaning by our experience of the uniqueness of others. So then the challenge, at least on this reading of King, and the way that I would answer the question, what is it that we ought to dream of, at least on this reading of King that I've been suggesting and looking at our contemporary moment, is not to seek a post-racial society, but to once again echo scripture and to take what the world is in all of its difference and make of this old world a new one. Thank you. Yeah.